25, season two of the drop in the 25, house. 25, season oh, two. Coming in hot MK for the new year 2021. My uh, my new motto is new year, new gear. I have brand new Beats headphones. Oh, yeah. I didn't even realize that. Yes. Shout out to Michelle for getting me these gorgeous new headphones over the holiday break. And sh- um, shout out to Limburg School District for my uh, for your my lock, I... my Logitech headset. <laughs> it's a little bit of a price difference, I'm sure. I did. I your did headphones see those. And mine. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I am uh, I am not picking mine up because uh, I don't I don't want to use that, that <laughs> for, for sure. Well, we'll see how it sounds after this. But we will see. Me. We will see. It is a new year, new season, uh, 2021. Although MK, I feel like the um, the 10 yard dumpster that 2020 was in just got expanded to a 20 yard dumpster for 2021 because people naively seem to think that when the calendar flips, everything goes back to normal, and we are far from that no, right yeah. now. Uh, it has been quite a lot going on since our last episode. We've seen. Um, an insurrection in our country's capital. We've seen a pandemic that continually rages on. Yeah. Um, just so many things going on right now that it is good to get back in the studio and do this with you. Uh, yeah. It's something that I've been looking forward to. Uh, our first guest that's coming up today is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but a uh, couple of things going on here in New York. I know that we are uh, starting a vaccine rollout. Uh, this oh, yeah. past week, I was lucky to get my first shot on Friday after school. And I'm going Wednesday. And you're going Wednesday. I would. I have to say I was pleasantly surprised at how um, well done it was down at Jones Beach. I know the first day they had it last week was a little chaotic for some people. Uh, I was able to get in the following day, and I got in and right out with no problem. That's uh, good. That's great. I'm hoping when I, I go in, mine's going to be a little different. I'm not. I'm uh, going to Jamaica Queens, so uh, high yes. school, not Jones Beach. So we'll see so how my story ends see. up this week. But uh, who knows? Let's see. But uh, but I was impressed with with how uh, how easily it was rolled out, and uh, I'm hoping it continues that way. Uh, hopefully, the light is at the end of the tunnel. We still have to take precautions. That's my biggest concern: is that everyone's going to start getting these shots, and then their guard's going to drop. Um, we still have to kind of be resilient and, and just see this thing all the way through. Yeah. But, until it's, uh, you know, everybody gets it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, school is, is still going strong. We are still staying as, uh, as normal as we possibly can. I don't know how it's going for you. I, I'm trying to keep my fingers crossed. It's funny because I feel like there's, uh, yeah, I think we know we know that this year is this year has been a tough year, but I feel like the last like since we came back from break, I feel like it's been a uh, it's been a tough go. I think I feel like it's like yeah. people are exhausted in with this year and the way that it's it's operated, and I feel like I feel like with the whole the remote learning, I feel like there's so many people that are that are remote out of fear for the virus and sending it to a family member um but then i also feel like now as the year progresses which which upsets me and i think which is making it so hard on us as a teacher i feel like there's so many people that are taking advantage of the fact that they can be remote more than in person i mean you know that you know i I think when we initially started this year we envisioned that half the class would be in one day half the class would be in another day but the way that it's come as far as students are able to stay basically stay home whenever they want uh we're finding we don't want to teach to the screen but because we have let's say four people in person and then another 20 kids on the screen it's like we have to teach to the screen so i I, i'm a little i'm a little upset about that and i know that's yeah that's what's so which is it's frustrating on the the teachers and and i see it from my colleagues and i hear it from my colleagues that you know and you see it that it's 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 it's, we're getting to a point where halfway through the year and it's like yeah. It feels again, like it's chewing. Yeah. Yes. And again, for, for those of us that teach those tactile subjects, those elective subjects where it's it's so important to have them in front of you to work with them and, and help them out and, and watch what they're doing, it's 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 a roller coaster. It really has been. It's just it it still makes me feel like I have not been fully effective all year. Yeah. Um, I still feel like and I'm always still feel like I am doomsday prepping, like I'm waiting for that call where 
the governor or somebody's going to say everybody goes fully remote because it hasn't waned and yeah. people still aren't taking precautions. And I'm, you know, I'm putting together take home kits of things and trying to think, you know, a month ahead from now, are they going to have what they need if they're all stuck at home? And, you know, I mean, that's, that for me personally, that's been the biggest challenge yeah. is trying to be for ready lack of for a the better next term. Step. Yes. Doomsday prep and figure out what the heck is going to happen if, before February break, we're all teaching from home again and everybody's home. So, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. I just want to give a quick shout out before we get to our episode to my buddy, Nate Barton, down in North Carolina for the new lid that he sent me in a recent artist swap. Um, Nate That's created good. this hat for me based on Hokusai's wave. Uh, it is giving me the, uh, the vibe to get back to the beach, which I am missing greatly. Uh, Nate, thank you so much, my friend, for putting together this this awesome hat for me. And we did a, a nice swap over the uh, the holiday break. Uh, it's been great to uh, to get to know him. And, and he's a fellow educator and artist down in Carolina. He's a big fan of the drop. So shout out to him. Our guest today, MK. Holy cow. Amazing. Amazing guest. Yeah, Unbelievable. Great, great start to the to the new season. Great and like start. you said, it's, uh, you know, season one, we started off with Vic Lee. And now we have Nathan in Walsh. London another uh another uk artist. member yeah, yeah, yeah over in over in chester north northern wales uh what an uh an unbelievably intelligent and forthright and humble gentleman yeah uh, we had the pleasure of seeing nathan's work in person a number of years ago at one of the galleries where he's represented here in new york city and we got to talk to him a lot about that and we got an invitation to hang out with him the next time he's in the city hopefully that's going to be yeah sooner, sooner than rather later. than later yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would, be, that would be great. So uh, strap in. Enjoy the ride, ladies and gentlemen, because here we go. Kicking off season two, episode 25, Mr. Nathan Walsh on the drop. And Enough. with us today on Monday, January 18th, Martin Luther King Jr. Day here in the United States. Uh, we are lucky enough to have with us the incredibly talented Mr. Nathan Walsh, all the way from Chester in northern Wales across the Atlantic. MK, this is uh, the second time now we've kicked off a season with someone from the UK. I, yeah, I guess we have to do that every time now. Next I season. think so. I think this is like <laughs> tradition now. This is it awesome. Is. And, uh, and we're coming at you from a new time today, 12 noon. We've been lucky enough that MK and I are both off from work today, and it worked yep. out perfectly because Nathan is five hours ahead, and so we weren't uh, worried about having to interrupt his nightly routines. Uh, so it's great to have him with us. Nathan, thank you, and welcome to The Drop, my friend. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really... I've been looking forward to this, and I, I hope your um, your students get something worthwhile out of it. So uh, I th I think they will. We had a we had a wonderful pre pre check chat with Nathan earlier last week, and uh, and MK and I came away so excited to talk to him. Uh, we have both been huge fans of Nathan's work for a number of years. We've been lucky enough to see it in person, as he has had representation here in New York City. Uh, which we're going to get to later on in the program. I have some questions for him about that. Um, but I remember specifically, MK, when you and I were on one of our uh, annual Chelsea gallery tour trips with our, our students, walking into one of the galleries and seeing Nathan's um, perspective paintings, which are, holy cow, unbelievably rendered. Yeah, um, amazing. I think, we, I think we talked about it for weeks after. And then, uh, and then we we were lucky enough to find Nathan on Instagram on on social media. And uh, as soon as I found them, I started following him immediately. Uh, and watching his progress has been just unbelievable to see. I mean, when we talk to the kids about using perspective and teaching them about perspective, and then you look at something that Nathan does, it just completely blows your mind with his approach to the work and we're going to get to the work in a little while too so nathan if you could for us my friend here in the drop we love to start off every episode with our artist origin story uh, very much like our marvel superheroes because all of our artists are, are superheroes for us and our students um so give us a little bit of background we know that you live currently in northern wales uh is that where you originally from and uh when you were growing up at what point 
did art take hold for you as something serious? Okay, well, I think I was uh, at school, art was one of my chosen subjects. It was a sort of an option. I think you could do sort of art or drama or, or PE. So I, I chose to do art. I was sort of, um, I was lucky in the fact that my, my father was a photographer in the Royal Air Force, a, a reportage oh. photographer. Mm. So, and he had in the house, there were some prints of Van Gogh drawings. He had, he, he was an avid reader and he had lots of books on painters and drawing and that sort of thing. Although he hadn't studied it formally, I think he'd done some night classes or something like that. So there were sort of, there were sort of signs around the house of, you know, so that were kind of, kind of interesting to me. And I think, you know, that interest in art was, it wasn't dismissed. It, I wouldn't say it was encouraged, you know, as something to follow as a career, but it was something that was certainly there to be, that could be discussed and something that was, exciting um mm. so i did art at school I, I i wouldn't say i was a particularly good student i was kind of i was i was average i, I was i was okay I and mean, i was pretty okay at most subjects it was just one of those things i was i was okay at but i one sort of distinct memory i do have at school was there were a couple of other pupils who were much better than i was now i i, I was very aware that there was a certain guy I won't mention any names, you know, just to protect the protagonist. <laughs> and uh, but there were there were a couple of guys who, who could, you know, would make beautiful paintings of trees or something or other or self portraits. And I thought I'm not as good as those guys, and it and it sort of irked me a little. And I and I think, you know, it's not it's not the best sort of aspect of my personality, but I'm I'm certainly quite competitive. If mm -hmm. I'm being to totally honest, uh, right. it's not something I like in myself, but it is there. And it kind of, it got me a bit. I thought, you know, why can't I make things like that? You know, surely if I can sort of work at this, maybe I can improve and get to their sort of level. So I sort of went through school and then sort of went to a sixth form college and did a, an advanced level in art. Where I would have been sort of 16 or 17. I don't know how that uh, equates to your, to your sort of level um, where the study became more more focused and and again I sort of I really enjoyed it but I didn't ever think about about, about turning it into a, a potential career um, from that point I went to do a foundation course which is the, the classic route in art education in the UK where you you would do a year where you build a portfolio of work which explores your particular interest whether that's mm -hmm. textile design um, three-dimensional design, graphic design, or or fine art. And I remember sort of we were doing sort of a, a life drawing class and one of the tutors said, um, well, I think you should go into illustration or some sort of graphic art, Nathan, because you can draw really well. And if you go and do a degree in fine art, you're probably not going to do any drawing at all, certainly not, not from a life model, because things have changed. And I was a bit disappointed in that, but I didn't didn't question his opinion and I sort of went along with that and applied to do a quite an open-ended degree course in it was called graphic arts but again it carried on that sort of quite diagnostic approach where you could sort of dip into different things and try your hand at typography and you know uh, illustration and animation and sort of self-initiated sort of painting projects mm -hmm. And I, I really enjoyed it. Again, I, I sort of, I was a kind of, um, again, I wasn't the greatest student. Um, I was kind of an average student, but I was super keen. Right. I always worked really, really hard. I was, I was a grafter as opposed to a student with bundles of talent. But right. I always felt that if I just kept at it, I mean, I sort of spent a heck of a lot of time, I remember in the, in the library and sort of looking at books and, uh, fortunately, we had a, we've got the Tate Liverpool, uh, where, where I did my degree. And uh, I was always going to shows and sort of being able to see work up close was really, really important to me. So I, again, I sort of finished the degree. I, I, I did okay. I didn't have any great 
idea about turning it into a career or becoming an, uh, an illustrator or, a, or an artist of, of any sort. I just sort of did it and enjoyed it. I mean, when I finished, I thought, well, what the heck am I going to do now? You know, it's sort of like, well, I don't really have any skills per se. Uh, you know, uh, I don't have, I don't have any now, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, I can, I can do this and I'm, I, th I think I'm quite good at it. So um, I'll start submitting some paintings, these things that I've made. I don't know what they are. I don't know whether they're any good or not, but I'll submit them to some competitions. And I started getting work accepted into competitions. Uh, the London's the kind of art capital in, in, in the United Kingdom. And there are a, a variety of quite sort of established groups, places like the, the New English Art Club and the the British, you know, the Royal Institute of Oil Painters and the, the Royal Academy and the Royal Society of Marine Painters, all these kind of various groups. Right. And I started submitting things to those shows and the work started getting accepted. Uh, I went down to see these shows and it was kind of quite exciting to go down, but nothing would ever sell or, you know, there was never any return on it. And I, I wasn't so sure about it all. And I thought, at that point, I started to think, well, I'm kind of making these things and they were sort of, they looked a bit old hat in a way. They were looked as if they were sort of harking back to a, an earlier period within art history, whether they were sort of, there was a bit of impressionism in there. There was a bit of sort of precisionist painting. It, and it was amongst another group of painters who were all doing similar things. There were kind of guys who were making things which looked like bit like, I don't know, Andrew Wyeth or Winslow Homer or, mm -hmm. and it was all very sort of competent and, and nice, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I wasn't entirely sure what these other people were doing either. Right. So anyway, I just carried on in this sort of aimless sort of way, make, making work. I started doing my own exhibitions uh, local. I was sort of back there living in, in North Wales at this, at this time and, uh, started doing this at the local shows and the work started to sell. Um, it was bringing in some sort of you know, minimum income, um, which was quite encouraging. I felt quite good about myself. I thought, okay, well, people seem to like this. And I think you know, the idea when someone buys a piece of work, they're kind of saying, well, we like this, keep going, keep, keep right. doing this stuff. And right. so that was kind of good, but it, it, well, I wasn't really making a living so I thought well what what can I do what else can I do with my time so I thought well spoke to various people and I said I would think you'll make a, a good a good art teacher so I went and did a sort of postgraduate certificate in education which sort of qualifies you to sort of teaching teaching sort of further education so it was sort of right. post post 16 right. and I managed to pick up a bit of teaching and then I landed a job actually on a foundation course in York, which is sort of towards the, the north of the country. Right. And that was kind of, uh, that was exciting in a way because all of a sudden I would have, teaching job was three days a week. So I had three days to teach and the rest of my time I could paint. Right. And I still didn't really know what I was doing, but I was, and it was quite a trial by fire really. I mean, I, I, I was young and naive. I didn't really have much experience as a teacher. So I was just sort of, I was winging it really. But it was a really exciting environment in the fact that there were some, there were some really good teachers and there were people who were, who were really sort of passionate about, passionate about their subjects. And I think I, I learned a lot from them. And, right. but I sort of got an idea that, you know, I, I think I need to up the ante in terms of the painting. I need to get more serious about this. I need to really work out you know what what I'm doing um, so I enrolled on a, a, a master's degree I think it would be an, an MFA uh, in America um, now it was sort of kind of it was a tiny course but I was very lucky in a way that the two guys running the course um, one was called uh, an artist called Steve Whitehead and the other call was called Clive Head uh, and they were both terrific realist painters um, but they had quite a serious way about them had a quite sort of a, an academic sort of edge and I thought this is 
exactly what I need. I suppose in some ways that there could have been an argument to go away and study under somebody completely different, to challenge your beliefs in that way. But I thought, oh, hold on, these guys are, are great. I need, I, I can learn from them. And so when I was teaching, I enrolled on this, this MA and um, did that for a couple of years. And I, and I think the work really evolved in that time. Um, one thing I will say, when I was teaching, I wasn't a great teacher and it was a means to an end in a way that I knew I would get so, you know, I'd get, I don't know, 800 pounds, a thousand pounds a month for, for doing this, right. but it would allow me to sort of really concentrate on the painting. And I don't think I ever missed a day outside of my teaching. I just thought I was religious about making work. You know, it didn't matter what sort of mood I was in, whether I wanted to do it, whether I could be bothered or whether I had an exhibition. I just did it. I never missed a day. Mm. And, and that was, yeah, that, that was kind of, that, that's held me in good stead, that kind of workmanlike attitude. Yeah, um, I, would, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, I, would think, I, I think that, I'm sorry, Nathan, just to, to cut you off real quick. I just, I think that it's a great message right there for our kids MK about we've we've talked time and time and again about how showing up and just doing it is yeah. such an important part of the process. Wait, sitting around and waiting for that quote unquote lightning bolt of inspiration is not necessarily always realistic. And that Nathan, what you're saying is essentially just show up and do something and keep doing something until it clicks. Is that basically the message that, that you feel? Yeah, I mean, I, I stayed in touch with some of the people I graduated with from my first degree and some students who were, who were far more talented than I was. And I noticed that lots of them had started to sort of drop off or, mm. they, you know, they weren't, you know, focusing on the practice anymore. They'd given up or they were just doing it in, such, in a really sort of minimal way and hope, hoping that some great opportunity would land on their, on their doormat. And, right. and I just thought, well... I don't think that's going to, that's going to happen. You know, I just felt I've, I've got to make things happen myself. I've got to sort of, if I can commit enough to this and commit to my sort of activity and consciously, you know, be talking to other artists, be making use out of those two great tutors that I had, that I thought, well, that's, that's got to stand me in good stead. You know, if I've right. got something great to show someone eventually, then hopefully something something will happen but it's so easy to go and do something else you know it's so easy to sort of take more days teaching or I, so many other things like uh, well not many other things i could have done but it would have been easy to give up you right. know there's, and there's right. always an opportunity to go and do something else that seems more fun right. at the time so what now let me ask you then nathan what is it that drives you to continually show up in the studio and work, especially in the beginning, like, because it sounds like, you know, obviously you are not an overnight success. Your overnight success no, is actually no, no. decades worth of yeah, work. Sure. So what, what keeps you going to the studio day in and day out and just working? What is it about that environment that just keeps you inspired to do it? Where was your hope in all that? Well, <laughs> I suppose there were certain there were certain artists that I was looking at at the time, aside from those two great tutors that I that I had. Um, I, I was looking at people like uh, Lopez Garcia, um, I don't know Charles Sheila, Richard Estes. Um, there, were, there was just there was just scores of different artists who I all who for one reason or another or a multitude of reasons. Had, were making or had made extraordinary things. And I just felt, well, what's to stop me from doing it? Mm, you right. know, if I yeah. really sort of apply myself, and work hard enough and think and, and apply what, I, what I've learned, you know, I've got the same 24 hours in a day that everybody else has. So, so you know, what, what's, what's to stop me doing it? I mean, I was way off the mark at that point. <laughs> but... When I went into the studio or the bedroom or wherever I was working, I thought, well, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a blank canvas here. I'll stretch something up. There's the potential here to make something incredible, you know, that, that really sort of extends 
you know, the boundaries of realist painting that does something original and unique, but still sort of builds on sort of, you know, traditions and, you know, that's sort of craft skills. It does something important. That, right. And I still feel the same way. I mean, I've got a sort of picture that's sort of ongoing behind me and one in front of me here. I still ha have the same excitement that I did, you know, 20 years ago about, you know, the potential that a painting might have. And it might, it, sometimes it's just sort of, you know, blind faith that I can make something that kind of raises the bar from what I've done before. And, and I think that's a real, you know, driving force that, I, that I've got. I think I've made some quite good paintings. I haven't made many amazing things, or maybe, maybe I've made anything amazing, but I might, the next one might be. And I yeah, just right. that that's- It's that unknown that keeps you going. That's what fires me up. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. um, I think it, it can be done. I, I sort of believe that, I, and I believe so many people have made extraordinary objects that, you know, why can't I, why can't I do the same? I love that attitude, that, yeah, that why can't I attitude. It's just yeah. like, but I also like, it's like, it's why can't I, but you just don't assume that you could do it. It's always like, why can't I, if I put work in? And I love that mm. aspect about it. Yeah. yeah. This all sound like, uh, cliches um but i suppose they're cliches because they're, they're they're true I, I know these things are true you know to my experience and you know th things are kind of hard for most professional artists with lots of professionals at the moment um but i'm still sort of holding on to the fact that you know i've still got this kind of object in front of me and something good will happen i think you know if i make this thing if I yeah. get this thing out there in the world somehow, that people will get behind it. I mean, I, do, I have, I'm not one of these kind of characters who's sort of popular on social media. I mean, I hardly know how to use the thing, you know, <laughs> but, but I do have a small group of supporters who've kind of stuck with me since I started out 20 years ago. And most of those people can now no longer you know, afford the work or they've kind of changed their interests or they haven't got any more walls to fill, you know, they've, they've kind right. of they've become saturated with, with stuff. But that small group, you know, you, you might only need a handful of supporters or collectors or curators or one significant dealer to, to change everything for you. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a question of sort of, you know, getting it, getting it out there and sort of, working with those people and yeah. right right that's it's interesting that you bring that up Nathan because that's going to segue into another question I have for you looking at your social media and knowing your exhibition history and we've looked at your, your website mm. with your your CV and your resume and you strike me as what we would consider more of a quote-unquote old school artistic approach where gallery representation is important to you uh, hands-on, you know, in-person exhibitions are very important to you. Uh, museum catalogs are very important to you. Where does that stand with you in a, such a digital world now where we see so many of these artists going on to social media and bypassing the gallery system mm -hmm. and using social media to just sell directly to uh, their constituents and their collectors? Why has it been so important for you to maintain that gallery connection and that old school representation? Well, I think first of all, when I sort of, um, maybe I'm doing something wrong, but when I get an image on my sort of phone and then sort of post it onto Instagram, all of a sudden the painting becomes a sort of this tiny sort of digital file, which bears very little relation to this kind of huge object that I've just spent six months Right. making so for yeah. me it's been it's been problematic in that people make assumptions on the work based on this image on their smartphone mm. so it's been sort of for me it's been critical that i've maintained a sort of real world you know sort of um career in the work that in in, in the way that people can walk into a gallery and see this physical object in front of them and and you know it's almost How like more respect for your work. You know, it's like having respect for your work too. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. 
No, you don't want to show it. You're, you're really thinking about the way that you want your work to be seen, you know? Yeah, I think now I might have sent it, you know, I, I send sort of, you know, JPEGs to sort of various people all the time. And, and, so, and that might pique their interest in something. It might, you know, we might consider this guy for a group show or oh, we might want to acquire this. We might not. But no one has ever really respond. No one's ever bought a painting from a JPEG. You know, no one's, you know, these can be quite expensive objects. Yeah. So I think being in front of the actual thing where, I mean, my work looks very photographic when it's on, when it's been condensed down onto a small format. But when you're stood in front of one and then you can get an idea that these things are all made up from sort of handmade marks, you know, that they have a sense of space, which is completely obliterated as soon as it becomes a JPEG, uh, mm -hmm. all these kind of interesting qualities, which I think makes me fairly re reasonably unique, uh, are lost in, in, in reproduction. Mm -hmm. So it's been good things happen when people see the actual paintings. Yeah. Right. That, that's, right. that's what I found. I mean, obviously, yeah. with, the, with the pandemic going on, you know, those opportunities have become very, very limited, which, which yeah. is going to be, a ch it's a challenge for all of us and it's going to be a challenge moving forward. Mm. But is that does that concern you, Nathan? I was going to ask you that, like with, with everything that's going on right now and that, that lack of the ability to see work in person, especially like MK and I, we discussed it just before we went on the air with you. We've had the luxury and the pleasure of seeing your work live in person here in New York through your representation in the mm. galleries here. And we can both attest to the sheer scale and the painterly quality when you see it up close. And like you said, noticing the small marks and like MK will tell you, I'm the guy with my nose pressed right yeah. up against it. And I'm He's the guy you got to watch out for in the gallery. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, but, but I'm like, I, I want to taste it. I want to touch it. I want to yeah. smell it. Like, like it, it's an experience. Are you concerned moving forward that a lot of these galleries are going to move away from that in-person experience and just go online and do everything virtual? Well, they're certainly trying it. I mean, I was in part, part of a, a digital, the, the, the digital version of Art Miami happened happened quite recently. So there's all these kind of various sort of wacky sort of, you know, uh, virtual reality viewing rooms and, and this, that and the other. I'm not convinced that they certainly don't seem to work for me, whether they work for other people, I, I, I don't know, but it's definitely a concern mm. you know, yeah. moving forward. It, 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 it certainly... It keeps me up at night. That's that yeah. sort of thing because yeah. anything that's ever that's been positive, that's been good in my career, has, has been off the back of people being in front of a painting. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, when I was sort of af after I finished my my master's degree, I thought, okay, well, I've, I've got some reasonable stuff here. I need to get gallery representation, and and at that time in my life, well, it, it was all about sort of photographing work and you get sort of medium format slides made right and yeah. you get these sort of packs of slides and sort of send them out to galleries and then the gallery director or the assistant would pick it up and just throw it in the bin and you know that would be you know, that's what happened right you know so it was a case then i mean i, I got the opportunity someone i know dropped out of a, um, a public space exhibition in westminster in london and offered me the chance to do it. So I thought, well, okay, I've, I've got some work, I'll, I'll do it. And I saw that exhibition as a way of hopefully enticing a dealer or some or, or gallery represent, representative to come and have a look at the work with the view to taking me on. I thought if I can get them there and they can see it, then I've got a fighting chance. Mm. Um, and that's what happened. I mean, I think I sent, I mean, they did a, a reasonably good catalogue. I think a hundred or so catalogues were sent out. They were all ignored. But I did get a couple of people to turn up to the show. I mean, I had a sort of um, a guy um, based in Zurich and a guy based in Mayfair who had a very sort of prominent gallery at the mm. time. And they were both, they were both keen. And that's when things started to move in a very positive way. Uh, all of a sudden, the work started to sell. And for, 
for decent, you know, for good money for a young artist. And uh, it was at that sort of point where I thought, well, you know, I'm a cautious kind of character by nature. And I thought, well, I can carry on teaching. I'm not particularly passionate about it, if I'm being honest. <laughs> or I can take the risk and maybe I can look to reduce my hours or maybe just get rid of the teaching job and, and just go for it. You know, I was still, you know, my early 30s and uh, I should have left before I actually went. Um, it, it was weird in a way because people were saying, well, why are you leaving this? It's a good job. And it was a good job and I, and I did enjoy it, but it wasn't where my passions really, right. you know, it wasn't what was getting me up in the morning and getting me right. fired up and excited. So uh, right. it got to a point, I think I sold, I sold a, a painting for what was the equivalent of my annual salary. Mm. And I thought that when that, I, when I heard the news about that sale, I just thought, let's do it. Right. I've been yeah. messing around for far too long. It's time. It's just time to go for it and we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Mm. Right. So right. that was, that was the start of something that was a different, yeah. certainly a, a very exciting, although it was also nerve wracking the idea of sort of, you know, not getting that monthly check that I've been dependent on for so long, you know, for removing that safety net, yeah. you know, and also what I didn't expect was when I started painting full time was all of a sudden I was on my own and I had enjoyed the company of my colleagues. There were some fun, interesting people milling around the art right. college, but all of a sudden I was kind of on my own all day, every day making these things and right. that took a bit of getting used to. Mm. Yeah. So there was the kind of that sort of social, uh, you know, that social element had been removed from my life and that financial security had been removed. So it took a bit of getting used to. Yeah, um, I would imagine. In some ways, though, I think that nervousness just made me work harder. I just got even more sort of driven about it. You know, yeah. it, uh, I'm not, not saying that was healthy at all, but that's the point <laughs> being. I, th I just worried myself into more activity. Yeah. yeah, fear is a great motivator in some cases. Yeah, apparently, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so Nathan, let's let's get to the uh, to the process part of your work because MK and I love to talk. Yeah, process. it's amazing. And just can we, MK? I know you have images ready yeah. to go. Can we pull yeah. up something with? I mean, watching and what what I love about your social feed on Instagram, Nathan, is that you do post stages of your work like we do see parts where you're just drawing and you mm. do the initial uh planning and and plotting things out and then we see you know progress within the painting itself and then we see the actual painting when it's completed can you walk us through first of all let's let's discuss your your choice of subject matter we know that you are a can i say a photorealist landscape urban scape kind of painter can we can we say that how would you classify yourself i, th I think i'm an I, i'm an urban landscape painter i think i'm i'm a realist painter mm -hmm. i'm certainly not a hardcore photo realist um yeah. but i think photo realism is an important element of what i do it's something that's in the mix in terms of my painting language mm. part of it but I'd, be, I'd prefer to be just seen as a realist. Yeah. Right, of some right. sort. In the, so in the now, the work, I, sorry, the work I make is, is, is based, on, based on our world. I'm not holding a mirror up to our world. It's not an exact replica of what's in front of us, nor is it an exact replica of photography. Mm. So. Right, right. And, and travel this was my next question. Travel has been such an important part of your subject matter and finding that inspiration. How has this past year affected your current work with not being able to really go anywhere? Because you've traveled to the United States quite a bit and you've done a lot of stuff around here in New York and, and your landscapes are based off of a lot of the urban centers here in the city. How has that affected you right now? Like what, ex what is it that you've been working on? Well, to answer your question simply i've just finished a gigantic sort of 11 foot wide painting right. that's taken up the past year so mm -hmm. i haven't really thought about 
What Travel. You <laughs> just, so okay. quite you had a good time then, I guess. Yeah. I've just made this painting. I thought, well, I'll finish this, and then I can worry about the fact I can't I can't leave the house and go anywhere. <laughs> but, uh, I, th I think travel has been very important to me over the years. I think, and I enjoy sort of, you know, I, I live a, a pretty boring life. My sort of day-to-day -day routine is always, always the same. It, it's quite rare that I talk to anyone until, until my partner comes home from work. Um, it's it's a solitary business, but to change that up, to go, whether I'm having an exhibition somewhere or I feel like, I don't know, traveling to Paris, going somewhere to, to start a new body of work, I think that's important. That's the contrast between the sort of that sort of almost monastic activity and then going to somewhere like New York where, it, where it's all kind of 24 hours sort of absolute sort of chaos sights and sounds and you know being sociable at an exhibition opening and you know talking to collectors and dealers and this that and the other so that's that's quite a nice contrast mm. um but the way i normally work pre-pandemic was i mean i've been coming to america for quite quite a few years mainly because that's where my gallery representation was Right. Um, but the way I would normally work would be to sort of wander around a, a city and just not with a sort of particular sort of plan of action in mind. It would just be more of a case of just 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 wandering about uh, normally, normally on foot and just sort of seeing seeing what was there. So I wouldn't want a predetermined idea of, of a painting before I went. I would sort of have to go and just find something which had some sort of visual potential mm. now from that point i would sort of you know i'd find a spot i mean a year or so ago i made a painting on the sort of hudson yards development which is probably part of that instagram feed and so i, I photographed the area extensively again i'm not a particularly good photographer but i can sort of i can take images um I work with a sort of a small sort of A6 sized sketchbook and I make sort of tiny sort of scribbles. There's something kind of important about those, although they're sort of not accurate in any way. There's something which links those drawings to a particular time, a particular place, which is helpful when I return to the UK, I start to sift through those images and sort of thumbnail drawings and then sort of think about how these things can be put together into some sort of compositional idea. So, so from that po point, what I tend to do is make a series of sort of postcards, postcard sized drawings, which are, which are sort of composites of those, those photographs and drawings. Right. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. They're, they're kind of scruffy mm. things, but they, sort of, they serve a purpose. Yeah, I'll make lots of these. Uh, they're just on sort of tracing paper. Um, they're not made to be exhibited. They're not sort of pretty. They're, they're sort of rough and ready things to, to think about. They get placed on the studio wall and most of them get rejected, but they're kind of, a, they're, they're around me while I'm working on a current painting. So I can think about, well, this one has got potential or that one isn't going to work or that one's derivative or or I can do better than that, or, you know, that for whatever reason, they get, they get thrown away. Because I might only make two paintings a year. If, mm. they're, if they're large, then, you know, the, unfortunately, there's no way around this. The, the sort of work that I make is very labor intensive. Yeah. So the compositions that I, that I choose, they've, they've got to be the most exciting ones. They've got to be the most ambition, ambitious, the most complex they've got to have something there which i think is again going back to that idea of raising the bar of, ex of extending what i can do so mm -hmm. so from from that point i'll have some sort of one of these sort of tiny drawings and and the way i work is it, it, it's very sort of um i suppose to a certain extent it's quite old-fashioned this is where the work begin, begins to sort of deviate from the sort of photorealist approach uh, 
I build everything from scratch. I start off with a, it's just one horizon line. Mm. And I start to plot building. Well, they're not buildings. They start off as just lines and squares, rectangles, triangles. And then I start to sort of, each sort of object or pictorial element will have its own vanishing point. So mm. it's kind of like, um, it's, a, it's an extension of sort of two point perspective. Generally, yes. there, are, right. there are other paintings that I've made which are quite different in nature. But mm. instead of there being two points, each pictorial element, whether it's a building, tree, person, car, will have its own vanishing point. So wow. you will have hundreds of these little X marks along yeah. the horizon line. Now, what that does, it, start, it, it helps me establish an object in a sort of constructed space which is divorced from the reference material from the photograph. Yeah. So all of a sudden they have their own, uh, they've got their own sort of, um, they have their own presence, they have their own identity. Right. Now that's where I start. So they're simple shapes. And the thing, by, by doing this, it allows me to change their position easily. I can right. change their height, I can take things out, so it's quite a sort of fluid, open-ended, you know, process in in a way. I think that's that's probably the most creative part aspect of of what I do. Um, things yeah. change an awful lot in in that in that time period. Now, for a large painting, the drawing stage might take a month. Wow. So there's lots of sort of you know rubbings out, trying things, putting them back in, taking them out. Um, now, it looks quite complicated when you see a finished drawing, like some of the things I've posted <laughs> on Instagram. But they yeah. start off very, very simply. It's just simple shapes that are, that are broken down and subdivided and subdivided. And they look, they look quite, quite interesting. I often think the, the drawings look better than the paintings on them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. they're, they're beautiful oh, on their own, for sure. They're beautiful. Why do you bother painting that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> But they, I think, Nathan, I think what, what is such a refreshing thing to see from an artist of your caliber mm. is how you've embraced that basic foundational knowledge mm. that we give the students at school who are always, you know, we always do perspective units. Mm. We always do units about observational drawing. And they always, always hem and haw and complain and wonder why they have to do it just mm. like this and like that and like this. But to, to hear someone who is so accomplished and has taken this approach to such a different level and made it their own and made it so unique and to hear your editing process and how you take things out and put things back and move things around. I don't think that they understand that how important that basic knowledge mm -hmm. is to get to that next level. Is that always how you've approached putting these things together was it's kind of like trying to build the house without putting the basement foundation in basically it, right that's the thing it's it, it, it's quite simple really but it, it, it looks complicated i'm not following a textbook approach to perspective i'm sort of making it up as i as, as i go along you know i'm going to sort of I, I will have picked things from other artists and i've you know, learned things from very from different sources and each painting that I make, it, it, they, they're never made the same way. You know, the, the, there's been, there's been um, ones recently where there's been, you know, more than one horizon line. So you can start to look down into a space and look up at the same time. And right. I think it's, that, I think that's kind of quite exciting. And the, the, the fact that things change quite quickly. Um, and I think, you know, you sort of make a change, then the painting or well, the drawing at that point will lead you, you know, down a different route. So things, right. you know, that's that's that, that's something which is, yeah, that, that's very exciting. That, yeah. That's part of it. Um, mm -hmm. Does it does it ever get to the point, Nathan, where it gets too complicated, where you're looking at too many things and the visual elements are too overstimulating? You have to say, you have to take a step back and say, well, that's that's too much. I got to pull something out of there. Well, I don't know. I, I think I'm drawn to complexity. I mean, I think the most Absolutely. recent larger paintings, there's um, 
one called the Mandarin Oriental that I've just finished, the one of Hudson Yards. Um, there was one, an earlier one called Transamerica, which is quite exciting, where you're dealing with what's in front of the viewer, but also dealing with that, the information that sort of, that, that's um, reflected, that's sort of in, in an inside space, an outside space, and also information that's reflected right. on the glass you might be looking through. Right. So they become a, sort of a real sort of mishmash of, of things, you know, of elements in, in a way. But I think some, some people don't like it. It's kind of a bit off-putting that you put all these kind of different things in. But for me, I think complexity is something that I'm, that I'm drawn to. I mean, it can't be a sort of a, an all-over complexity, so you end up with something which looks like wallpaper. Um, yeah. You've got to have elements of calm and serenity amongst those pockets of, of, of detail or information or stuff so it's uh, that that's a challenge but um again it goes back to the idea that i mean i've started a, a new painting behind me that i'll share quite quickly which is a it's it's the first thing i've done where it's a composite of two different cities mm, really so, wow well I was, I, I, i've started doing things with reflective material and i thought well Who's to say what's reflected onto this this glass window? It could it could be anything? So yeah. I thought, well, okay, let, let's do something which really kind of challenges the idea of you know a literal realist painting. So we've got elements of uh, Chicago mixed in with elements of San Francisco. Oh, that's cool. So it becomes almost like uh, almost like a, a dreamlike space. Mm. Um, it's still built on those kind of solid foundations of sort of plotting vanishing points and constructing a space that is hopefully still convincing it, it has a, it has its own sort of reality I, I think which is independent from photography and drawing right but it it, 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 it becomes its own thing so right. and obviously this place doesn't exist right but it, it, I would hope that a that a viewer can enter into that world and feel that there's, there's a reality there's a sort of reality to it mm. yeah. i i feel like okay. Nathan, that, that that you would share a kinship i don't know if you're familiar with the with the work of british painter patrick hughes do you know oh, patrick yeah. Hughes? Oh, yeah. and and his and his take on perspective and playing with perspective i feel like that's kind of where your work is headed where you're 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 kind of taking this idea of what we think we know and what we see and turning it on its head and making it something completely unique and original. Is that kind of the goal that, that you see yourself going? Yeah, I think that, I think that is the goal. I think it's going to take a bit of working out. And sometimes my sort of thinking is, is ahead of what I can actually do. It hmm. might take three or four paintings before I can, you know, fully realize what, what I'm talking about. Right. You know, the next one might not be the painting. It might might not sort of lock together. It might not sort of work together those different elements, you know, as, as harmoniously as I can. But give it a few paintings, then hopefully I'll have, I'll have ironed out those issues. So um, yeah, I think, I, yeah, absolutely. I want to do something which is, um, you know, I sort of love all different sorts of painting, you know, where it's, uh, it doesn't have to be sort of, you know, you know, realist uh, at all. I think it's, um, I mean, a sort of a, a painting by, I don't know, Antonio Tapies can be just as sort of convincing as presenting a sort of, you know, an alternate reality. There's something right. incredibly concrete, you know, uh, about his work that's that, that compared to, I, I don't know, um, uh, Lopez Garcia or, you know, whoever. Right. So right. it's... Uh, if that makes sense. It does. It's, it's, to me, Nathan, it sounds like you are trying to create your own visual language mm. through this use of perspective, which mm. I find fascinating because perspective, right, MK? Uh, yeah. uh, perspective is so grounded in rules mm. and what we know about perspective and how it works. And when we teach perspective, it's always about those foundational elements of, well, here's your horizon line, here's your vanishing point, here's multiple vanishing points, but these can only go to this vanishing point because this angle won't read as realistic and what, you know, whatever have you. But what impresses me so much about what you do, Nathan, is that you take all of those basic, like, let's say that 
for example, the original perspective rules are Latin, and you're building off of those root words and creating a whole new language. Pushing it to another level, yeah. And pushing it to another level, yeah. Look, so I, I think it's important that, or for me at least in the studio, that, you know, that I don't sort of accept things at, as, as given. It has to be done a certain way. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's up to me to sort of accept certain things, but then reject others. And yeah. it, means it, it means that the, each work becomes quite speculative in, in nature. It doesn't mean they're going to sort of work per se. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a question of making it up as you go along and hopefully you'll get it to sort of work in a certain way. And I think that's what separates it from like from that what what makes it art and not let's say technical drawing, you know, technical drawing would be much, you know like you said Tom like rooted strictly in the rules of perspective, mm -hmm. but you're like taking the rules of perspective and like and spinning them on their own, on their own. And yet it's and yet it still has that draftsman like quality, especially at the beginning, which is yeah. so impressive because then he's able to take that to another level and and make it into a fine art painterly approach where he's almost synthesizing these two different ideas. Nathan, could we say that that's kind of the goal of what you're doing also? I think, I think that's fair. I mean, it's important to understand for me that, you know, perspective is just a, it's just a system that I, that I can use and exploit and, and manipulate, you know, um, but I don't have to follow any, you know, set agenda or set series of rules. It's in the same way that um, I mean, you mentioned you'd sort of been up, you've been up close to see my paintings, and you've got an idea of their sort of textures and their physicality. Yeah. In the same way that you know I use photography, uh, and but my work isn't about duplicating photography in any way. That's why I don't see myself as a photorealist, although I've been aligned with that with that with that movement. Um, it's photography can be used and I and I do use it but it's just kind of part of the ingredient to mm -hmm. my mixture of things that are that are right. going on and you know and the all the, and all these different systems of ways of describing the world I mean for me the problem with photography is well the great thing about it is that it provides you a lot of information that you can use a lot of raw material quickly mm. um, my, the major problem with it is it tends to be flat yeah, and yeah. painting, the history of painting is about, a lot of it's the history of describing space. Yeah. So where does that leave you with a sort of an utterly flat two-dimensional image? There's, there's an instant problem. Right. So yeah, right. my sort of feeling was, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I admire so many of those sort of photorealist painters. And, you know, from the first, you know, generation onwards to the guys, you know, I don't know, Rod Penner and Davis Yeah, Cone. oh, Rod Penner, yeah. You know, yeah. it's just extraordinary stuff you know they're just fantastic painters but i think what i'm trying to do for me there's no point in me trying to become another sort of a tramaneel or one of these guys you know even closer to the photograph and it's pointless um because they they're doing what they do and, and, it, and it's great but for me i thought well there's an opportunity here to what happens if i reintroduce mark making what what about if i sort of have you know, complex layering of paint from sort of thinly diluted areas of paint to sort of thick pastos, mm. you know, isn't that going to sort of introduce a whole richer language to what's going on within photorealism? Right. Right. And I think, some, I, you know, I think some people, you know, got behind that, you know, and that's, that's great. So yeah, for sure. A, it was a conscious decision where I thought, I was looking at stuff and think, well, what if we take this a different route? do something different with it yeah. see, see I, what happens. I love that mk i love that that message of not working in a vacuum like nathan mm -hmm. understands what else is out there and yeah. he's actively picking and choosing what he wants to take from what mm -hmm. he's seen from other people and mm -hmm. making it into something of his own which yeah. i think yeah his his great approach to that it's it's what keeps him so fresh and so relevant in terms of what he's doing that's yeah. also that's also what drives art forward too that's you know that we're not right. doing what the people next to us are doing right. you know exactly. I, I mean at the same time i i sometimes think that you know the, the concept of originality is 
can be can be overplayed in that you don't have to be completely different to the guy next to you in a, in a show, but you I think you have to be different enough. I mean, I yeah. think one of my great influences, you know, uh, Canaletto, I think his, his nephew, Bernardo Bellotto, um, was not as good a painter, but he was different enough to be recognised in his own right. So I think that that's... Um, I think that's something to, something to think about. That you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's just can you sort of push it in your own direction? Mm, you know, yeah. um, I love that. It's, yeah, that's it's, great. It's uniquely yours. That when someone goes into a show or or even sees it on Instagram, say, oh well, oh that's that's this guy. You know, it can only be a a Nathan Walsh painting. That's, yeah. you know, and I think that's having developing and sort of building your own. Your own personal visual language, I think, is key. Is key to sort of moving forward and getting people to to spot you, to to notice you. Mm. Speak, yeah. So speaking of seeing a Nathan Walsh, can we get a peek at that piece behind you there, Nathan, and, and see what it is you're currently working on? With you? Yeah. So this this is the one where we're sort of it's a sort of composite of bits of San Francisco, bits of Chicago. We're looking through a sort of a revolving door so we can sort of see through it, but we've also got these things which were reflected on the glass of the door. Right. Um, it might be a complete mess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I, I, just, no, I, I, don't know, I don't know where it's going. And I think that's, that's quite exciting. I mean, it's also quite nerve-wracking that this isn't an obvious solution to to a problem it's uh, it's um it's trying something um let, let's let you know let's let's see where it goes uh, yeah yeah that's i think that that's just it's a great message nathan for our students too to be fearless and not worry about necessarily the end result yeah, because willing, they always to... want to know that. They always want yes. they want to see exactly what the painting is going to look at like before they do it. Mm, That's it. Right. They always right. want to. Yeah, it's also that, that, that age group too. Right. You but know, if it, but... and if and if it doesn't meet that expectation in their head, it's, it's an failure immediate failure them. for sure. It's yeah. an immediate failure if they even get to the end of it. Because a lot of them will reach that frustration halfway through and then pitch it. Or even say, like you know, like like Nathan said, like not knowing what what the end result is going to look like, they they can't deal with that. And then they, I always say, like these paintings, you know, have the idea. Then there's an awkward stage. It's that middle stage where they don't know whether or not they can even bring it to the point that they that they want. That they just they bail right. on the piece too. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you ever feel that way, Nathan? Where you're almost to the point where you or you almost pitch it and and, and leave it. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of paintings I wish I had have stopped and I wish I had thrown them away and done something else with them. But um, <laughs> I think that's the same, same for a, a lot of artists. I think we can be overly critical of our sort of, of our previous yes. work. Um, yeah. it, it also, doing something like this, which, which is going down a different path, which is sort of moving things on from the, from the previous work, it does bring into sort of play the idea of, okay, well, if I change things up, how are people going to respond to this? You know, the people who kind of like maybe the more sort of literal scenes. I don't know. You know, mm. it's, um, that, that, that's a worry because ultimately, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, I survive. I, I paint full time. I don't do anything else. You know, I survive on the... On the generosity of my my supporters, my collectors, right. and right. so yeah. it, it's it's a worry sometimes. You think, well, okay, well, I push this. I'm excited by this. Is anyone else going to be? I, I don't know. Yeah, right. you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem is, I mean, I I could carry on making, you know, very well made, conservative views of Paris and London, and New York, and. Uh, and I'm sure that there will always be a market for that sort of thing. But I think I kind of want more out of this. And it goes back to that idea of sort of starting, you know, in the studio, sort of 7.30 in the morning and being fired up about what I, what I can do. Mm. I would, you know, you see a lot of artists who make the same painting again and again and again. And it, it's, not, it's not for me. You know, all my sort of artistic heroes were, 
were always trying to push themselves and reinvent what they were doing. And that creates longevity too. It's like you see that in music too. It's like one group has that hit song, and then their next song that they try to produce is trying to duplicate that next hit. But it's the mm. artists that that realize that they have to push themselves forward, try different things that have that longevity right. in their career. Right. Absolutely, I think that hopefully that yeah. yeah. But I think Nathan, <laughs> that what what the the commonality in what you're doing is is the sheer talent that you portray in the work. It's the craftsmanship. It's that level of uh, knowledge that we can see in the work, right, MK? I think yeah. that it's always going to be a Nathan Walsh. Like you said, when you walk in, we know what a Nathan Walsh looks like, regardless of what avenue you're pushing it, and 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 what you know what level you're trying to take it to. Because I think that there is there is such a um, an overwhelming sense of draftsmanship and knowledge and technique that just screams out of every piece. And I think, I don't think you'll ever lose that no matter what the subject matter turn takes for you. Well, I suppose when, when I'm taking a new direction, it's about building on what I've done before. It's not rejecting everything. It's not right. kind of, building, uh, yeah. you know, yes, I'm taking, you know, there, there are changes that are happening from the last painting, but I'm not throwing everything away. You know, the, this is something new which, which builds on the previous work. Right, so. right. Which is such an irony because he's doing buildings and he's <laughs> yeah. building off of prior knowledge of buildings, which is just fantastic. Uh, yeah. MK, we are well over an hour on our first episode. I of know, season unreal. Two. I know. Uh, but I, I got to know I one could... more thing, though. I got to know about how you ended up in the church. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, <laughs> well, I, I decided to sort of come back, you know, after I finished my, my, my teaching job in York, I sort of, um, I've been painting for about 10 years or so. And this place came up on, on the market and I could just about afford it. And my, my parents were they're still quite close by. Uh, it came up and I thought, this place is for me. I just thought it had this sort of double height space at the back. We'll have to do a. We'll have to send you an image with the sort of light coming through the, the stained glass window. Yeah. Um, and I just thought this place is for me. There's this sort of sense of uh, first of all, double height space means I can make big paintings. Uh, I can get them in and out reasonably well. Um, the, but there's nothing much goes on around me. There's a sense of sort of stillness and, and, and quiet here which yeah. which really appealed but when, when I did the viewing on the property I, I just thought oh, this is great I had this kind of emotional reaction to it but I didn't think about oh, how am I going to heat this place or <laughs> you know, where am I, I going to sleep and all this sort of yeah stuff. so how do you how do you have it set up is it like you know is well, it basically like a studio like a well, well, not a studio yeah. an art studio but like an open space where you have your yeah space. it's it, it's sort of uh, when I bought it, it had been sort of partly converted, so there was the walls in place. So it's been a, a case of just trying to improve what had been done before. So there's a kitchen area beyond this, and there's a, a front room, and the sort of you know, the bedrooms are, are upstairs. Um, it's been fun, but it's it, it's expensive. It's going to be a lifelong imagine. project, you know, and uh, a labour of love, really. But I think that. I've kind of filled it with things which are, you know, inspiring to me. You know, I, I'm an avid collector of knickknacks and kind of stuff, you know, other artists' work and bits of sculpture and, uh, and books. I mean, books are a terrible weakness of mine. When I was an art student, I used to spend my, my student grant going around all the sort of secondhand bookshops and picking up, picking up bargains and... Uh, you know, that's kind of, that stayed with me, you know, yeah. now, but I, you know, a chapel full of books, which, uh, yeah. but I, I constantly refer to these things, you know, it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's part of me and it's all, it's all kind of part of this activity. These things are sort of, how do they function as signs or reminders or something that, that all sort of, you know, all becomes part of this activity one way or another. Yeah. Mm. Un wow. Unbelievable. We can, I could talk to this gentleman all day yeah. long, MK. He's just Absolutely. a wealth of knowledge. I mean, it's just, it's been a pleasure. Nathan, 
Thank it's you so pleasure. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks it's for been, it, oh, it, it is our pleasure for sure. Going from seeing your work in person to getting to know you and, and then to being able to interview you like this has been such a great thing for MK and I to kick off season two, I think. Right. We, we couldn't have found a better person to start off this no, season. No, absolutely not. Yeah. What a great thing. Uh, everybody who's tuning in, let's uh, let's keep this this train rolling, man. It's it's a new year. We're hoping for good things. I know there's still a lot going on, um, but uh, you know, I was starting to see some good things happen. Yeah, definitely. And hopefully, hopefully, this is one of those things. So, Nathan, again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, in. Nathan. Pleasure. Thank you. It's been a great time, and like. Like we say at the end of every episode, it hasn't changed in season two, MK. Keep looking out for one another. Keep loving yeah. one another. Keep taking care of one another. We need each other more now than ever, folks. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Season two, episode 25 in the books. Next time around, we will see you again. Peace out. Thanks Bye-bye. for joining in.